In Harrisburg, Illinois, a search is on for missing wife and mother, Carla Burns. Family and friends are getting really nervous because they usually would have heard from her by now and she's not responding to any text messages or calls. Joining the search, her husband, Brian, he warns she's suicidal. He also offered that maybe she, because she was a nurse, that she maybe overdosed and put, you know, she took insulin, injected herself with insulin and overdosed herself in that way. But when charred human remains are discovered, police become immediately suspicious. What part has her husband played in all of this? He was very nervous. Um, he was pacing. Um, he kept asking, um, did we find Carla? And he kept looking towards the burn pile area. And he was just extremely nervous, I felt. It's a story of control, of a failing marriage, and of greed. He had um, almost a fetish for, for money and, and property and control in the relationship. Can investigators prove that Brian Burns murdered his wife and so bring justice for her children? They're great kids, and they went through a horrible, horrible thing, um, losing their mother that way. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> The woman who was to become Carla Burns first met Brian Burns in 2008. Both were in the medical business in Texas. He was an emergency room doctor, she a mother of two teenage boys, and a popular teacher of nursing at a local college. A very caring person, obviously. She went into a healthcare field um, where, she, where she had had some success and, was, and had gotten into teaching. Um, in the healthcare field. And so a uh, very caring person, very outgoing, someone who was adventurous. Stacy Kinter, an Illinois police special agent, would get to know all about Mr. and Mrs. Brian Burns. Dr. Burns was a, a, I guess he was an ER physician in the area and Carla was a nurse. So they were doing quite well for the area. They made very good money. Carla and Brian bonded through a love of travel. He encouraged her to try one of his lifelong passions. Carolyn Canville is a reporter who's been researching the story of a marriage, a murder, and a relationship which got off to a great start. Brian Burns has always loved scuba diving. He's done it since he was young, and he really wants Carla to get into it because he thinks they could really share some good time together doing that. So he, um, he shows her, he teaches her how to do it. She gets her certification, and so now the two of them enjoy traveling together and scuba diving together and seeing all the beautiful colors under the water. The couple went on exotic holidays to indulge their newfound love of diving. It was on one of those trips that they witnessed something that was to prove significant later in their lives, a cremation. They go on this one trip to Costa Rica. The two of them were, were looking through their binoculars and they see something that really makes a lasting impression on them, he says. He says they see on this nearby island performing this beautiful cremation ceremony. It's this, this ritual that they do to cremate and bury, scatter the ashes of a loved one who has passed. And the two of them look at each other and they say, isn't that beautiful? And, and, and they, at that moment, right then and there, they both decide that when they die, they want to be cremated. In 2009, after dating for a year, the couple married. They settled in Harrisburg, Illinois. Brian Burns takes a job as a local doctor at Harrisburg Medical Center, and Carla is working as a nurse and also teaching at Southeastern Illinois College. With good jobs, the couple could afford a high standard of living. They owned a very nice home. It was um, just outside of Harrisburg, and it was uh, located on a pond, and it was in a, a wooded area, and it was a nice uh, piece of property that they owned safe too, a community to enjoy. It's in Saline County and it's pretty rural. It's a, it's a good sized town. It's one of those towns where everybody knows everybody and um, 
not a lot happens there usually. But behind the facade, the relationship was showing signs of strain. Forensic psychologist Dr. Judy Ho has been reviewing the married couple's timeline. They were both caregivers. Brian was a physician, Carla was a nurse. They both seemed like givers, and maybe their relationship was actually quite peaceful in the beginning. But a few years in, their relationship became very conflictual. There were multiple accusations from Brian that Carla was cheating on him and perhaps committing financial crimes against him. And it seemed that the relationship had really devolved to a point where it was almost past the point of no return. In 2010, Carla had re-established contact with her ex-husband and the father of her sons. Brian wasn't happy. Brian Burns did accuse his wife Carla of some infidelity with her ex-husband. Um, she had, um, had taken up a relationship with her ex-husband um, at least emotionally again. She was talking to him frequently on the phone. Um, I think she was confiding in him uh, about the trouble she was having. But Carla insisted she was just reconnecting as a friend, talking about their children. Brian did not believe her. The relationship had gotten so bad that Carla finally decided that she wanted a divorce, but he would always reject that idea. He would insist that they stay married, even though they were obviously very unhappy, and she grew more and more fearful of him over time. The marriage was simply not working. At one point, Carla and Brian agreed to separate, but months later, they agreed to give the relationship one more try. At one point, they did rekindle their relationship um, after uh, several months of separation. Um, they got back together again, and they ended up actually, at that point, moving to the residence uh, that they lived in uh, in Saline County. In 2013, Carla decided she finally wanted out of her marriage. She started to um, confide in friends that uh, he, he was doing things that were concerning to her. Carla files for divorce. She's citing irreconcilable differences, and she also says that he is verbally abusing her. She packs up her belongings. She moves out. Uh, and um, Brian is, you know, he's not happy about this. Carla moved into a hotel in Marion 30 minutes from the family home. Arguments about money began to dominate the divorce proceedings. In August of 2015, Carla says that Brian forges her signature and drains their savings account of the $63,000 that they had both put together. So you can see from the divorce papers that they're fighting about money, just constantly on and off about how the money is going to be split. She's asking for support. He's, he's accusing her of economic blackmail. Carla began to discover the secretive way that her husband had organized their finances. He had the paperwork drawn up so that he was the only person on the deed. Even though they had gone to the realtor together, even though they had gone, and it was her understanding that she would be on the deed as well, as is typical in the United States when it comes to marital property. After their initial meeting, he had contacted the realtor and instructed them to put the deed only in his name. For investigators, there was only one reason that he had done that. Burns would not have included her name on the deeds because he had um, almost a fetish for, for money and, and property and control in the relationship. Brian was also rearranging things so that he would appear to have less money than he actually did. The real Brian Burns was a Brian Burns who sent his $300,000 in savings to his uncle uh, Curly during the pendency of the divorce. You know, the real Brian Burns was the Brian Burns who put the deed to his house only in his name. And then during the divorce, deeded the house to his uncle Curly so that he could later get it back. Brian Burns' fetish for money made this far from an easy divorce. It's not just in the divorce papers that, that they're fighting. Brian is apparently really harassing Carla by text message and by phone calls. He sends her these, these just angry text messages and she texts him back and she says, stop texting me, leave me alone. Rod Demery is a one-time murder squad detective. Carla claimed that she was being harassed by him. She um, revealed text messages on his phone that said, you know, please stop calling me, 
please stop harassing me. And if you want to talk to me, call my lawyer. Even her therapist had taken a note that she she was she did have some fear of, of Burns at the very end of that relationship. It's just getting more and more uh, angry, and she's getting nervous. She's thinking, you know, he might be, he might turn violent. She ended up applying for several protection orders from Brian, and all of them claim verbal abuse and that she feared that it was gonna escalate to physical abuse. Carla wanted to go home. Brian did everything he could to stop her, accusing her of being in a mess. She was asking for relief, um, being afforded the family home to live in because she was uh, living out of a hotel room. Um, he made accusations that she was abusing um, prescription drugs. Text messages between the two of them show that uh, he was probably the one abusing her prescription. Shortly after the split, Brian's accountant informed him that Carla was filing her taxes separately and not as a married couple. It meant that Brian's tax payments would rise. If they decided to get a divorce and they would file separately, Brian's taxes would be increased by $15,000 a year, and it seemed like that really aggravated him. As someone who earned around $300,000 a year, $15,000 may not have been very much to Brian Burns. But detectives soon faced a question. Was it enough to make him kill the woman that he'd married just five years earlier? One of our dispatchers actually came back to my office when this is not a normal thing. Uh, he came back to my office to advise me that they had received calls uh, all throughout the day about Carla Burns um, missing and all the family members expressed uh, sincere concern about her well-being. On March the 6th, 2016, Carla Burns was seen leaving the nursing college where she taught. Carla Burns was seen on video leaving her place of employment at approximately 3 p.m. Carla was known to regularly call and text friends and family. But from that afternoon, messages and calls to her went unanswered. Family and friends are getting really nervous. They haven't heard from her in two days. On the 10th of March, Carla was reported missing by family and friends. They hadn't heard from her since the 8th. Detective Maria Dwyer was on call at Illinois Police Department. A co-worker of Carla Burns had contacted the Marion PD and expressed her concern because Carla had not been at work and had not called to work for two days. So we sent one of our patrolmen um, out to the motel where Carla Burns was supposed to be staying. He just did a well-being check, um, did not discover Carla to be there. Then throughout the day, we received numerous calls from her coworkers, to her family, uh, to even her ex-husband um, had called the Marion PD to express their concern about her um, not showing up for work, not calling anyone um, to explain her absence. When a missing person report comes in, um, police check the obvious. Um, if this person may be with a friend, family, or somewhere they just hadn't told anyone. Um, then they look for things that are extraordinary. And what was extraordinary to her friends and family was the context of her disappearance. They wanted to almost immediately make me aware that she was going through a kind of turbulent um, divorce. They haven't heard from her in two days, so they contact police and file a missing persons report. We received a call also from uh, Carla Burns's uh, divorce attorney. He had indicated that Brian Burns's divorce attorney had contacted him because Brian had showed up at his office to express his now concern because he was being advised by friends and family that Carla had not shown up for work and had not called for work. A sheriff's deputy was dispatched to the Burns family home. Brian is friendly, come on in, let me show you around, he's very talkative, talks up a storm, but claims he has no idea where Carla is, I have no clue. If she's staying at this motel in, in Marion, I'd be happy to go over there with you, but he claims that he just, he has no idea where Carla could be. A few hours later, the officer returned to check for her car, which he found parked in the garage. This was Carla's only mode of transport. 
Six days after Carla's disappearance, Brian Burns contacted the sheriff's office. On that day, Saline County Sheriff's deputies were invited by Brian Burns out to his property to look for his wife. He lived in rural Saline County, a home surrounded by woods. Brian Burns had indicated to sheriff's deputies that perhaps Carla Burns had committed suicide and she was out in the um, woods somewhere. Burns joined the officers, but they found nothing. As part of their search, deputies wanted to look over a neighbor's land, but Brian was reluctant to join them. He didn't like to trespass in that there were horses on the property and those horses were not very friendly. After they dropped Brian Burns off at his home, they obviously thought that was an area of interest and went back to the property. The deputies found a burn pile, which was suspicious because it had rake marks in the uh, ashes. Upon further inspection, the deputies found what they believed to be human remains. It was just six days since Carla had been reported missing. Sheriffs called in Illinois police. Detective Stacy Kinter was assigned to work alongside Detective Dwyer. When we had received the phone call from the uh, deputy uh, on the property near Dr. Burns's house um, with the burn pile with the suspected bone fragments, that really, um, we responded immediately to that area, Detective Dwyer and myself, and our crime scene, they began processing that area. We had gained permission from the property owner. And it really piqued our interest because it was de directly adjacent to Dr. Burns's property. It really made us start thinking, maybe we need to narrow our focus a little bit on Dr. Burns. As the detectives surveyed the scene, Brian Burns arrived. He was very nervous, he was pacing. Um, he kept asking, um, did we find Carla? And he kept looking towards the burn pile area. And he was just extremely nervous, I felt. Based on what she had learned from talking to Carla's friends, Several other things appeared strange to investigators. The vehicle of Carla Burns, um, the RAV4 actually being parked over at Brian Burns' residence was a red flag. Um, that was the vehicle that all of her friends and family described to be her vehicle um, and that she would not be in any other vehicle. It was known by her family, friends and coworkers to be the car that she drove. And so when deputies found the car at the family home, that immediately uh, made them suspicious that, that something was rotten there. She would not be driving any other vehicle. So for that vehicle to turn up in, in his garage was definitely a red flag. The other major red flag for us was uh, the fact that Brian Burns at that moment had Chloe the dog with him. Uh, that was also another thing that her friends and family had clearly expressed that if he had the dog, uh, there was something wrong because Carla would never leave without her dog. Detectives Dwyer and Kinter asked to interview Brian Burns about the day his wife disappeared. He seemed very nervous. He was pacing, he was looking out the window. He would frequently get up from the table where we were interviewing him and, and check to see what our crime scene services were doing. And he would uh, frequently ask us, did we find Carla? Um, do we, what's going on? Do we know what's going on? And he would ask us to check with the crime scene services people to determine what was happening with the investigation. His initial um, story was that Carla was on spring break, that she was off of school, her teaching and from work, and that she was simply on spring break and that she would turn up in several days. Burns claimed that Carla's state of mind could have been the cause of her disappearance. He also provided other stories about Carla possibly committing suicide, um, that she had a handgun and that she could have killed herself and we just hadn't located her. He also offered that maybe she, because she was a nurse, that she maybe overdosed and put, you know, she took insulin, injected herself with insulin and overdosed herself in that way. Burns was asked why Carla's car was at the house. One of the other things that um, he mentioned was it was quite common for her to go ahead and uh, leave the vehicle uh, at his residence, that she would come and go freely um, to the residence, even though they were no, no longer in a, you know, a functional relationship, um, that he was working so much. It was an amicable relationship that she, she could come to the residence to 
uh, do her laundry or watch her television shows and stuff like that. So um, that was his explanation uh, for the vehicle being there. A tissue of lies. I didn't buy into that at that point, just from the information that we had that they were estranged and that um, he was in possession of her dog and that her vehicle was located in his garage. In the garage, the detectives inspect the car. He opens the doors for myself and the Saline County detective, um, and we begin to look around. Uh, there was an orange uh, bag that was located inside Carla Burns's vehicle, um, which I begin to open up and um, start to look inside to see if there might be any type of uh, clues to where what her whereabouts may be. But I think we just knew that this was not good, that this was the things that he was telling us um, that Carla was probably not going to be okay. At that point, I believe law enforcement would indicate that Brian Burns did become a suspect in Carla Burns's disappearance. Detective Dwyer asked for the details of any of Carla's credit cards. Once again, he kind of became defensive uh, that, you know, why did we need that information? And we explained, you know, so we could track her, her financials, you know, to see if she had actually used her card anywhere uh, more recently, and that would help. And then he kind of laughed that off and explaining that he had just, you know, heard uh, a lot about identity thefts and credit card thefts. So he was just being cautious. And mind you, he's talking to the police. Um, so it was a kind of a strange statement, you know, to make at that time. Carla Burns was still officially missing, but detectives had one leading thought on their minds, Mrs. Burns had been killed by Mr. Burns, and they didn't like what they were hearing about Dr. Burns' recent behavior. I'm receiving additional phone calls, even from his own best friend, um, who had ha since had contact with Brian. He didn't know what to think, and that maybe nothing at all had happened to Carla, or she was chopped up into pieces, and that was his actual statement. The strange behavior of Dr. Brian Burns was a red flag to investigators looking into the disappearance of his wife, Carla. I think that there was a general consensus that we did not believe what things he was telling us and that he was offering up almost too much information and just trying to give us anything, I guess, to maybe lead away from him. The police department had also been taking calls from Brian's colleagues. It seemed that his odd behavior hadn't just been obvious to investigators. His coworkers didn't normally consider him to be a very friendly person. Uh, some coworkers either avoided or did not talk with Brian. Uh, but the day that she is actually being reported missing to our department, he was almost going out of his way to have conversations uh, with some of his coworkers and being overly friendly. Burns' closest friend also offered startling information about claims that he'd made. Brian had actually made threats to harm himself um, and that he was started to plan his own funeral uh, when they were separated once before. Um, and that they ultimately uh, got him to agree to, to go to a mental um, institute at that point. And then they rekindled their relationship, um, but now this, this most recent separation again had his friend concerned about uh, Brian's mental state. He said he didn't know what to think, that either Carla wasn't truly missing and she, you know, she was going to turn up at, at any point during, you know, the next couple days, or she was chopped up into pieces somewhere. Um, that's how he explained it. For detectives, too much wasn't adding up, and Burns's odd behavior suggested he was hiding something. They asked him back to answer more questions. In my interactions with Brian, getting to know Brian, he just had a tendency to overtalk. And that was actually a lot of uh, the way that I went around about my investigation was just making that contact with Brian and just letting him talk. Um, and I think that that worked to our advantage because in doing so, he just, when you overtalk that much, you tend to say things that you probably shouldn't. I don't think that Brian was actually very arrogant that the police was going to believe him. I think he was becoming increasingly desperate because he saw what might be in his future, which would be a very, very long prison sentence at the very best. And so he started to make up increasingly fantastical stories that had no bearing in reality. It was the next day 
when the county sheriff's office decide to arrest Brian Burns. I believe the state's attorney's office decided there was enough information um, to go ahead with an arrest for the murder of Carla Burns. The tactic worked. He began to talk. On the 16th of March, uh, Brian told police that his wife was actually dead. Investigators were finally about to hear Dr. Brian Burns' version of his wife's death. He advised that Carla came to his residence after work um, because he had Chloe the dog. Um, he had taken Chloe to a vet that day, and uh, Carla was coming there to pick up Chloe. Carla shows up. Uh, they had previously agreed to prepare dinner and to have dinner together. Um, so he had prepared her favorite meal. Carla gets there, they eat, and then she decides she would like to shoot his nine millimeter uh, handgun. Burns had taken them out into a more wooded area of the property to show her how to shoot this weapon. He handed Carla the handgun. She shot the first round. And the second round, the gun kicked back shooting Carla in the forehead. Dr. Burns said that he panicked. He's a doctor, but that he panicked. Uh, he tried to save her, but he was unable to save her. She uh, started bubbling um, from the mouth, uh, that he tried to give her CPR, uh, but it was difficult. Um, he felt her pulse, and then she was no longer there. He didn't have his cell phone with him, so that was why he couldn't initially contact anyone um, to, you know, request an ambulance or anything like that. Um, he indicated that Chloe the dog uh, started um, to lick at Carla, um, so that grossed him out. So he picked up the dog um, and he took uh, Chloe the dog back up to the residence uh, where he would put her inside the house. Burns claims that he decided to cremate his wife there and then, the way the couple had agreed way back on their Costa Rica adventure. He indicated that Carla's wishes were that she were she wanted to be cremated and that her ashes should be spread on their property that they owned in Harrisburg. So I burned her body and scattered the ashes because I remembered that was her final wish, to be cremated. He's so noble. At that point, he decides to go ahead and drag Carla several hundred feet, um, probably to a burn pile that's located in a pasture area. Um, he specifically described turning Carla over. Um, so she would have been in a prone position, face up, and he turned her over face down and uh, dragged her through the yard. He specifically describes tissue and brain matter uh, was seen collecting on, on, the on the grass and sticks as he was dragging her on the ground. Um, Brian then says that he picks her up um, and then carries her the remaining uh, few feet to the burn pile where he then throws her on top of the burn pile. Um, and at that point, um, he sets the burn pile ablaze. And after that, he spread the ashes in the pond, uh, in a creek on the property. And he said that that was what she would have wanted. Was his story credible? Not to forensic psychologist Judy Ho. Of course, none of this makes sense. The reasonable thing for anybody to do after an accident would be to call 911. But I do not think that he was in his logical mind at this point. I think he was suffering a mental breakdown. Was Dr. Brian Burns about to get away with a story that his wife had accidentally killed herself? As a medic, he had specialist knowledge that he could use. I think Brian really didn't have an idea of what he was going to tell the detectives that would make sense. And so I think he was trying to just throw a bunch of things at the board to see what sticks. And he thought, oh, trauma-induced amnesia, because then maybe I wouldn't be responsible for my behaviors. Dr. Burns talked about a fugue state, um, kind of an amnesia that it you know, maybe he went into some type of an amnesia thing and just is not, not able to recall what happened. That's probably the closest that we ever got to him confessing to what happened. He says, I just, I forgot. I had trauma-induced amnesia. 
I didn't remember a thing until just now. This is a self-diagnosis by Dr. Brian Burns. Police are having a hard time buying that, obviously. He does indicate to investigators that the reason he didn't come forward with that story to begin with was he was suffering from um, what he now describes as a, a psychogenic fugue or a fugue state in that um, he has witnessed something so horrific that um, his mind was not allowing him to recall what had actually happened. I think he knew that the gig was up and he had to make something up that would make sense, but this didn't make sense. I think this was an emotional plea. I don't think he really thought through what he would say to the detectives that would cause them to understand what had happened. When he had finally remembered what had actually happened, Burns said that he hoped to avoid being tried for any offense. He had already had a plan in his mind that when police came to his residence, he was going to take himself hostage by holding a gun to his head. And he was going to request myself and Detective Dwyer respond to uh, his residence so that he could speak with us. He was going to make us coffee. We were gonna sit out on the front porch and uh, overlooking the pond. And he was going to tell us what had happened to Carla. And if we didn't believe him, Dr. Burns said that he would have committed suicide. By now, detectives couldn't be sure what to believe. The truth would prove to be much more elusive than anyone could possibly have thought. He had hatched a scheme with a cellmate to uh, have the state's attorney kidnapped and held for uh, ransom until his murder charges were dismissed. All that remained of Carla Burns were charred bone fragments, making it impossible to establish how she had died. But the type of gun she had allegedly accidentally killed herself with suggested problems with husband Brian's story. There simply weren't enough rounds to have been fired through that gun to uh, have allowed Carla Burns to have killed herself accidentally. A nine millimeter has a very, very low recoil. There are very few guns that have enough recoil to even, you know, rise over an inch out of your, your, your hand. One of the early reasons that Brian gave for his wife's disappearance was that she had possibly killed herself, a tale which may have given one truth away. Brian Burns had indicated to investigators that perhaps his wife had killed herself with insulin. Um, that is an area of interest to investigators. That is an area of interest to me. I firmly believe that Brian Burns incapacitated Carla Burns with insulin. I'm not sure that Carla Burns was dead when Brian Burns put her on the burn pile um, and admittedly burnt her body beyond recognition and beyond forensic analysis. Um, but if she were dead, it was not by a gunshot wound from that weapon. Burns takes the detectives back to his home to show them what had happened. He took us to the area where um, he said that Carla was shot and then he showed us how he was able to uh, take her body over to the burn pile and um, the steps that he took to place her on the burn pile to light the fire, how he removed her shoes and took them back to the house and placed them in her closet and um, just different details about how, how, what he did with Carla's body after she was dead. But for investigators, it was clear this was no accident. When the case was first presented to me, as I reviewed the voluminous amount of evidence in the case and interviews, the burn pit on the neighbor's property uh, did seem like it was a little sloppy because I did believe, and I think the evidence shows that this was not an act of passion. This was a premeditated murder, which, which um, Dr. Burns had gone to great lengths to plan. As police collected evidence, more discoveries incriminated Burns in the murder of his wife. He was seen on the trail cam um, actually getting a chainsaw uh, from his, his neighbor's um, pole barn um, and collecting uh, some of the, the debris and, and tree and 
twigs um, and ultimately he created that burn pile just days prior uh, to this incident. Further suggestion of premeditation was provided by Burns' strange behavior with his neighbors before Carla's death. Two days before Carla Burns was murdered, Brian Burns had taken a firearm to his neighbor and asked his neighbor if he wanted to shoot the firearm. And then Brian Burns is wearing gloves, um, rubber gloves, like surgical gloves at the time, and asks his neighbor if he would load the weapon. Uh, the neighbor thought that was a little unusual that he was wearing gloves and even asked Brian Burns about the wearing of the gloves, to which Brian Burns said, his grandfather always taught him to wear rubber gloves because otherwise the rounds would possibly um, rust. Now this neighbor thought that was a little weird, but he didn't question it. Effectively, what we believe two days earlier he was trying to do is get his neighbor's prints on the rounds on the gun um, so that he could frame his neighbor uh, for the murder of Carla Burns. And I think he even cleaned the gun wearing the gloves. And I, we believe that it was to put John Baker's fingerprints on that gun. Burns' treatment of Carla's cell phone was also suspect. Carla's phone was discovered underneath the car uh, truck seat of John Baker's that was located in an adjacent, just north of Dr. Burns' house. And her phone was in a plastic baggie underneath the seat in John Baker's truck. Further evidence to us that he was intending at some point to frame his neighbor for the murder of Carla Burns. Burns was held in custody to await trial, and it seemed that reality began to bite. Burns was desperate when he was in custody. I don't think he had a bail that he could reach. My recollection is his cash bail was $3 million. He knew he would not be able to post that in bail, and so he further knew that he was in custody until uh, and if he went to trial for the murder of Carla Burns. I think Burns was desperate to get out of custody. Desperate and afraid, Burns began talking to his cellmate, an experienced career criminal. Carla's husband, Brian, was about to display behavior which could be thought of as outlandish, but for the fact that he'd already killed once. Burns approaches his cellmate, asking him if he had, um, almost in a, TV show fashion, asking him if his cellmate had someone who could, quote, do a job for him. The cellmate had been in and out of prison his entire life, um, and he saw an opportunity to perhaps help himself with his current predicament. Burns's cellmate went directly to the jailer and indicated that the doctor, um, as he called him, was desirous of getting some help with something he didn't know what. He had hatched a scheme with a cellmate to uh, have the state's attorney kidnapped and held for uh, ransom until his murder charges were dismissed. Burns's plan was reported to investigators. They had to gather evidence before they could prosecute. Dr. Burns, I believe from listening to some of the phone calls that he made or the uh, recorded conversations that he had with our source, he believed that if he could make it look like uh, supporters of him had abducted the state's attorney and were uh, wanting to, I guess, support Dr. Burns and his innocence and wanted to claim his innocence, that if the state's attorney was out of the way, that this would all go away, that he would be set free. I think it was all about self-preservation at that point. And it was self-preservation beyond logic. And it's quite possible at this point he was starting to suffer more delusional thinking that wasn't treated and possibly not even discovered. And that can happen sometimes with relatively healthy individuals when they are thrown into a huge and intense stressor. It's like the mind doesn't know how to cope with it. And when the mind is overwhelmed, we sometimes see the people suffering mental breaks when otherwise they didn't have any mental health problems to speak of, or at least that anybody knew of. And so I think at this point, he wasn't able to reason logically and his desire to preserve himself at any cost was taking over and causing the exacerbation of his mental breakdown. Maybe delusional, but not so much that he didn't have very worldly motivations. Those directly involved with the case consider Burns's motivation for the killing to be purely financial. 
the divorce settlement was not to his liking. I feel like this whole divorce was very upsetting to him due to the fact that he was a doctor, they had a lot of money, and he knew that he was going to lose uh, a significant amount of money during this divorce. Brian's accountant testified that Carla had planned to file separately and Brian's taxes would increase by $15,000. The reason I know the taxes is the impetus is because while his wife was burning, he went to Marion, went into her hotel room, gathered tax documents, is seen on video surveillance coming out. Brian Burns was convicted of the murder of Carla Burns in December 2019 and sentenced to 40 years. He was also sentenced to five years for the concealment of the homicidal death. Based on his sentences in the attempted kidnapping of the state's attorney, the murder of Carla Burns, and the concealment of a homicidal death. I was glad to see that this finally came to an end, um, that he was uh, convicted, uh, and that her, Carla's family was able to have some sort of closure and could move on with this. It had been four years before uh, since this went to trial. So I, I felt good about where we were, and I felt like we, we put a lot of time and effort into the investigation, and it's always good to see um, these type of results and that the right person was uh, convicted of this. I did also eventually meet both of her sons. Um, they would fly here from Texas uh, during the trial. Um, that was when I initially met with them um, and got to know them. Um, and I mean, they're, they're great kids and they went through a horrible, horrible thing, um, losing their mother that way. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Married in 2009, the relationship on the rocks by 2013. Carla and Brian Burns were two medical professionals who had seemed the perfect match for a couple later in their life. But Dr. Brian Burns was not about to let nurse Carla Burns take what he believed was rightfully his, everything. <laughs> 